This, you can repeat after me. God is good. Jesus is Lord. Go Bills. <laughs> uh, I, thought, I thought that one might get the biggest one. You should be convicted right now already. Uh, no, it's good. It's good to laugh in church. It's good to laugh uh, in our lives. I know that one of the things that I uh, find just hilarious every single time is when someone is not in real danger, but they get like super scared. I love those like ring doorbell videos where you see, you know, somebody getting just scared out of their minds or something like that. Gets me every time. And uh, about 10 years ago, my wife and I and my parents went to Disney World. This is before we had kids or anything like that. And uh, as, we were, uh, as we were there, we went on my favorite ride in the entire world, which is the Tower of Terror. And uh, it's, it's a great ride, got a great buildup, great story. And then uh, as, you, as you climb up, you don't even really realize you're climbing up. And then it, it, the doors open and you see the whole park all, all at once. And then you drop 13 stories. <laughs> And so one of the things they do on this ride is they snap a photo, and you can see here this photo of my wife. <laughs> yeah. It's like her jaw's about to come off her face there. <laughs> and uh, she was terrified, and I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> Uh, and thank you to my wife for allowing uh, all of us to find some joy and laughter in her fear this morning. Uh, it was a great time uh, for all of us not named Sarah. But, uh, you know, the, the truth is that sometimes, you know, fears like that can be funny to, to take a laugh at. But there are some real fears that live inside of us. That can, that can eat away at us, that can really start to damage our lives and our relationships. I know that one of the things that I have a fear of is uh, feeling like I am not providing value. Like I'm going to work really hard, do my very best, and, uh, and then, but it, it's not going to really matter. It's not going to really be meaningful. And it's a fear that I have to wrestle down pretty consistently in my life. I, uh, I recently was collaborating with a friend uh, on a project and uh, working on something. And one of the things that uh, happened at the end of it is like I, I did in, in my approximation, I did like all of the work and the, the background. So I like prepared everything for this person. And then they were the person that went and delivered it. And then they like got all the praise for it. And usually for me, I'm like, I'm good with that. <laughs> like, I'm usually fine. Like, I, I actually even enjoy that kind of a thing. But for whatever reason, this time, um, as this person's getting all this praise and, and not acknowledging me at all, like, I'm like, I'm like feeling this, like, you know, I get the little <laughs> head cocked to the side, like, hmm, uh, it, this isn't sitting right with me. And so what I thought at the moment is just like, man, I'm just like, craving some sort of like uh, appreciation here or something like that. And maybe there was a component to it of that. But what I, what I thought on later is I was like, you know what? I think what this is, is that um, I didn't feel like my friend was valuing the work that I did. And not only that, what that therefore means is I am not valuable. And I actually started assigning my worth to it. And so what looked like on the surface was like, oh man, I'm just like that guy craving appreciation, which is also not the person I want to become. Uh, but it, it, was, it was much more than that. It was actually driven by a fear that uh, I don't have value if I'm not producing something. And that's what was really going on in that situation. And I think that for many of us, we have these deep-seated fears inside of us, and we don't even recognize sometimes that they're driving our interactions or our emotional responses, what triggers us, all of that. And maybe yours looks different than mine, but I think every single one of us have these fears inside of us. So my question I want you to start to think about and wrestle through today are what are your deep-seated fears that you have? What are your deepest fears inside of you? And not only that, how do you know if faith or fear is what is guiding your decisions? Because I don't care if you're a person who follows Jesus or not. None of us want to be the kind of person who is gripped by fear and are making our, 
our life choices based on fear rather than who we want to become. And so that's what we are going to talk about today. And uh, the good news is Jesus has some, a, a really unique and fresh perspective that is not something I would have come up with on my own, um, but that he is sharing with his closest friends, his closest disciples. He's, he's kind of laying out a blueprint of how to live. And uh, so we're picking up in our Matthew series. This is in Matthew chapter 10. This is verses 26 through 33. Here's what Jesus is saying. So have no fear of them, for nothing is covered that will not be revealed, or hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the dark, say in the light, and what you hear whispered, proclaim on the housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father." But even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. So everyone who acknowledges me before men, I also will acknowledge before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I also will deny before my Father who is in heaven. Now, I want to go back real quick to a a section here and just highlight it again. Verse 29, are not two sparrows sold for a penny and not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? Even the hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. Now, sparrows at that time and, and even today are just kind of viewed as like that a common bird. They're kind of like they're a dime a dozen. Even here, the value that that is placed on them is that they are worth a half of a penny. (laughs) Some of us, you see a penny on the ground, you don't even stop to get it, and a a sparrow's worth half of that is the value that the culture has assigned to them at that point. Now, the truth is, is that God has a very different vantage point of sparrows. After all, he's the creator of them. So he actually thinks there's some interesting things about them. And there's some things I didn't realize about sparrows that maybe you know or maybe you don't. So um, sparrows, I always thought they were like a couple of pounds in weight. They actually typically weigh less than an ounce. Kind of crazy. They can fly 5,000 miles, which is like Southern California to Northern Alaska, without sleeping. They'll, they'll fly all through the night and then eat during the day. And sometimes they'll take a quick, you know, a little nap there, I guess. But they can go the entire distance without sleeping. Some of you productivity people in here are like, man, I got to hang out with some sparrows, figure out how they're doing this. They'll take um, cigarette butts that somebody has littered and they'll put it in their nest and it will detract away predators from eating their children or attacking things that they're protecting. They actually are changing, evolving and morphing. They, they're changing the pitch and the tone with their voice over time which is kind of crazy. Um, Researchers have just kind of started to figure this out about them. And researchers also have found this out, that um, when when they are flapping, uh, they, they used to think that they were like waving high. It was like a greeting to somebody. And now they've actually found out that this is like an angry flapping. Like they're communicating their emotion of anger to another bird. Like you thought it was like a, hey, and really it's like a, get out my space here. All right. So these sparrows are interesting creatures. And again, I've always thought, oh, it's kind of the boring one that ends up on my bird feeder. I hope you get out of here so we get a cardinal or something. But the truth is, is that God and Jesus are saying, these are amazing little creatures. He's saying that, uh, you know, Not one of these birds are going to fall to the ground outside of the knowledge of God the Father. And here's the thing is that God knows every intricate detail about the sparrow, but not just about the sparrow. God knows each and every intricate detail about us. He knows the number of hairs on our heads, which is something that nobody else knows. Meaning that God knows things about you and I that we don't know about ourselves, let alone somebody else. And what what God is saying here is he says, Jesus says, fear not, you are more valuable than many sparrows. See, the sparrow has great worth to God, 
but you have way more worth than that. And here's the thing. I, I, you may have been told before, whether overtly or subconsciously, that like you don't really have that much value. You really aren't that unique. You really aren't that special. You really aren't that interesting. But Jesus comes in and he says, you know what? You are worthy. You are accepted. You are loved just as you are. And, and you, are, you are amazing because you are made in the actual image of God. A reflection of God is what you reflect with your life and your being. Jesus is, is breaking down this false lie that we can believe in our lives, that we are not worthy, that we are not enough. Our worth is found completely in our relationship with our Heavenly Father and who He has made us to be. And here's the connection here that Jesus is making. He's saying that if you can find your worth found in Jesus, then you do not have to give way to fear in your life because you know what your solid rock foundation is. It's Jesus. It's not all these other things that can assign you worth in our world and our culture. That's not what gives you your worth. Your worth has already been defined. So he says, fear not, you are valuable. And I've never thought about being the idea of like conquering fear as like me just finding myself in Jesus. I've heard things like, you know what? You just need to be courageous. You need to, you need to take a leap of faith. And, you know, there's some truth to, to be courage, courage and, and faith and, uh, you know, and taking steps and conquering fear. Like those things are related for sure. But at the same time, I think we know in, inside of us, like we've, we've heard people say, like, just take that leap of faith. We've seen people take that leap of faith and they fell flat on their face. <laughs> and so then we're like, OK, well, I'm not I don't want to become that person who fell flat on my faith face. I want to be a person of faith, but I also want to be a person of a sound mind. And here's what Jesus is saying is that the way you expunge fear in your life is that you lean into God's perfect love because God's perfect love expels all fear. His word says it so clearly for us. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it's because we fear of punishment. And this shows we have not fully experienced his full perfect love. It means we haven't experienced that. We're not applying that. We're not letting that seep down deep into our bones. If you want to be a person who lives a life of faith over fear, you've got to recognize that you have been accepted and that you are valuable to God. That is the antidote to fear. And again, it's not what we would usually think about, but it's not what gives you value. It's who gives you value. If you are grateful this morning for a God who loves you and continues to shape your heart to not be filled with fear, would you just say amen this morning? Amen. amen. Now, Jesus in this passage, he wants to encourage us and he wants us to not be living lives that are filled with fear. But there's, there's actually more that he is trying to accomplish as he's having this conversation. And it actually comes right before this passage, these, these set of verses that we looked at. It's all a part of the same conversation. Um, but this is a... This is Jesus talking to his disciples and we get to listen in, which is awesome. So here's what it says is Jesus sent out the 12 apostles with these instructions. Don't go to the Gentiles or to the Samaritans, but only to the people of Israel, God's lost sheep. Go and announce to them that the kingdom of God is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. And here's what I think Jesus is doing right here. He is laying out his vision for what the kingdom of God looks like and what the disciples are to do. Like, like a quick summary of this passage is, go seek out the lost. Tell people, the kingdom of heaven is not way out there, out in the sky. The kingdom of heaven is near. It's now. It's here. It's tangible. It, we can access it. You, 
Go and heal the sick. Believe in Jesus' healing and see what he might do. Uh, Don't allow the people that you love to give way to evil in their life because you know where that path leads them and you love them too much for them to go there. Don't hold on tightly to your resources. Give generously to others. This is the mission that Jesus is laying out for you and for me. It's an exciting one. It's not one where we picture ourselves even in heaven of like sitting on some cloud and like playing a harp or something. And it's nothing what heaven is like. And we sometimes we think about our mission for God is like, oh, I, I, I go to church for an hour. And it's so much more than that. It's so much richer. It affects every single part of our lives. And we have the hope of the world living inside of us, allowing us to become a light to a world that is struggling in the midst of darkness. That is the mission that Jesus has given to each and every single one of us. And I don't know about you, but that has captivated my heart. And, but here's the thing. This is what Jesus is teaching us here. He's saying that he wants that mission for each and every single one of us. But, but if we give way to fear, we cannot carry out that mission well because now that becomes the driving force in our life, not the mission Jesus is laying out for us. And I think that's part of why he's trying to address this fear inside of us. Because think about this. If we we can't fully live out God's mission, if we've got fear, uh, you know, taking over our lives. So if you've got a, a constant fear over your finances, then maybe what ends up happening is you stay in a job that you hate and that is destroying your soul way too long. You're in this toxic work environment. And so what, what happens is you're like, man, it's just like I, my, your joy starts to zap away and your desire to work starts to go away. Maybe even your desire to get out of bed in the morning starts to go away. And, you know, we we think it's like, oh, man, this is just like a bad job I've been stuck with. But really, what's driving that is a fear of God's provision in our lives. And, And what I'm not doing is advocating for not having a game plan in life. Like, that's not the point. The point is that we've got to recognize the thing under the thing. The thing under the thing that could be driving you from staying in that job much longer than you should could be fear. Or how about this? How about when uh, someone sleeps with someone else that they never had intentions of doing that? They said, I'm, that's not for me. I'm not going to take that step. And so, uh, you know, what we think, whether we've been in that situation or somebody else we know has been in that situation, we think, okay, well, that's probably because there was a lack of information or a lack of discipline. And maybe, maybe some of that is true. But maybe what it was is that there was a fear of being lonely, a fear that I'm never going to be loved unless I give this up. And so it's actually fear that is driving a decision that we never wanted to make. Or how about this one? This one is real in my life. How about the fear of our kids making the wrong choices? And my kids are nice and leading the way sometimes at, at this one. And so I can get fearful that they're going to continue down a path I don't want them to go down. This is a real fear that's in front of my face oftentimes. But see, here is the temptation of what happens for us is we may suffocate their ability to make age-appropriate independent decisions. And what happens from there is either they become over-dependent on us as parents or they become resentful that we don't trust them. And either way, we don't like either of those options. And what it comes down to is that we're actually just fearful of the wrong decisions they could make. And of course, our job and our role as parents is to guide and shepherd and show them the way. Like, we have to do that, and there's a lot of uncomfortability there. But we also cannot be the kind of Christian parents who let fear dictate how we raise our kids. Amen? Amen. And, and I think this is what's so interesting to me about fear is that it can be so much more below the surface. It's not just like overt and that you can see it all the time. But what it does is it robs us 
of our ability to actually live fully on mission for Jesus. And I believe he has so much more and so much better for each and every one of us as his followers. And the way that we get there and live a life of faith over fear is, again, we live a life that's remembering that we are accepted and standing on the truth of his love. That's what is our foundation. That's what defines us. Now, I want to give you one word of caution that I think is super prevalent in our American culture. And, um, and, and I fall prey to this as well. So I'm not, I'm not standing on some ground that I'm not, uh, not on. But we fear in our culture not being busy. And, and maybe you believe that when I say it, or maybe you don't. But think about this. If uh, somebody says, how are you doing today? Most common answers are good or, you know, you know, man, so busy lately, so busy. I actually hear that more often now than I hear good, <laughs> right? And it's like busy has become this badge of honor because if you're busy, that means you're significant. If you're busy, you have a lot to do, and that means there's a lot riding on you. And so that is where we start to find our value is because, yeah, I got, I got so much going on. My work is like really, you know, all this is relying on me, on my job. And so we start to find ourselves thinking that busy is, is, the, is the place that we need to be, and that's where all the good stuff gets done. And I, I'm not against hard work. I'm not against like trying to provide opportunities for your kids and carting them around, all that. That's, that's good stuff. But what I'm saying is, if we're not careful this busy thing can overtake our lives and overtake our calendar. And soon the result that happens is we now don't have space for God to speak to us because we, we just haven't made time. Like his word says to be still and know that I am God, but we are really uncomfortable with being still. Like, like you mean I got to go 10 minutes without looking at this thing? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start <laughs> twitching out out here. And, but, but the truth is, is that if we are to take that time to be still, it will affect, uh, it will, it will affect our relationships with other people, reflect our relationships with God, allow us to have deeper thoughts, deeper work, deeper connections, but it can't, it can't happen if we have the fear of slowing down and missing out on something. But God has a better way for each and every one of us where our souls are found in him and are connected to him. That we don't have to live a disconnected life from him and his plans and his purposes for us. So I want to invite the worship team back out. So if the way we drive out fear is by accepting God's love for each and every one of us, how do you actually do that in your life? Like, how, how, how does that practically look like for, you know, later tonight or tomorrow morning? So that, that friend I had collaborated with that, that I had done, done that project with and um, had realized like, man, something's going on here. Something's pinging inside of me. I, I will tell you that the, the first thing that happened for me was that I thought, Okay, something I can feel like an emotion coming out in this moment. And I didn't like blurt out in the middle of our conversation. I had like this much self-control, um, but it, but it pinged me to say like, okay, I, uh, something's going on here. So later that night, uh, put the kids to bed, they're laying down, my wife's reading, and I just took some time to actually reflect and I'm not always great at doing this in my life, but I did it on this particular uh, situation. And it was in the midst of uh, just sitting quietly for five minutes. That was it. It was five minutes long. It was not like this three-hour endeavor that I, that I partook on. But as I sat and I reflected, I, I started to say, like, what was driving that emotion? And I started to talk to God and say, like, am I just, like, am I just like hungry for, for something that is, like, you know, this is not the guy I want to be. I just like am hungry and thirsty for appreciation. And that was where in the midst of that conversation, it came to me that it was like, this is actually that you fear that you are not valuable if you're not producing something. That's what's driving this right here. And it was in that moment that I 
it, it was, it opened my eyes. It was like, oh, I had never seen this before. And the truth is, if I hadn't taken that five minutes to be with Jesus and talk to him, that thing could have creeped up again and again and again, and I could have become that guy that I didn't want to become just because I didn't make space for Jesus to allow him to be the one to remind me that's where my identity is found and it's in him and who he has said I am, not in what I produce, but in who he has made me to be. And that I'm defined by my relationship with my heavenly father. Nothing can separate me from the love of God. Nothing can take me away from that. So that is what I stand on. And so this morning, I, I wanna give you an opportunity to do that and talk to Jesus. So I'm gonna invite you right now to bow your head and to close your eyes. Even if you're not a, a, a believer in Jesus, I, I wanna encourage you to reflect. And I want you to ask, these two questions, they'll be on the screen if you, uh, if you end up you know, needing to reference them. But what are your deepest fears that are inside of you? Maybe that you recognize or maybe that you don't. And which of them are allowing me not to become the person that God would have me to be? And second, pray, pray a prayer. God, would you reshape my heart so I don't live a life of fear, but I can live a life on mission for you. I know it sounds simple, but it's profound when God starts to reshape your heart, reshape your mind, to have your priorities aligned with his priorities, to have your ways following after him. And it's just a simple prayer. The one I prayed on that night was something like, God, this isn't who I want to become. Would you help me not live in fear? Would you help me find my worth in you? So I'm gonna give you a moment to speak and to listen to Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand at this point. And church, I, I want to invite you, as you've come out of this time of praying and reflecting on the fears that can grab hold of your heart, I want this song to be your anthem this morning, to sing it out and to say, Jesus, I'm not going to let fear be the one who drives my heart and my life. I belong to you. I am yours. So church, would you lift this song up together?